Hey guys, so we're just about to begin our talk on a Korean radiology and it's given to us by Professor Matt Calloway who is the Medical Director of Professional Practice for Clinical Radiology. So yeah, you can take it away Professor Mark. Thank you Bridget, thanks everyone and um, welcome this afternoon to what I hope is a, a session that makes you think about a speciality that you probably have never heard of before in terms of diagnostic and interventional radiology. Um, what's it about? Well, before I can tell you why I think you should do is a is a um, uh, is a new uh, a career pathway. I think I have to explain a little bit about what the whole speciality is about. And it's about the the science of diagnosis and imaging and utilizing that imaging capability to perform increasingly more invasive techniques to allow us to look at alternative treatments and alternative, if you like, pinhole surgery uh, to the treatment of patients. Initially, it was based on the science of x-rays uh, and, and that was started about 100 years ago, but it's expanded to cover both uh, body scanning and also uh, MR and ultrasound examination. And recently, we've added in the facility to uh, use radioisotopes to label uh, pathways of energy, so glucose pathways, the Krebs cycle, and as such we can do functional imaging uh, of pathways and allow us to look at the way that we uh, treat and identify cancer and also um, uh, pathways such as dementia. So it really is a speciality that I think is changing probably more than any other speciality um, and going forward will continue to become integral to the way that we deliver healthcare. So um, clearly that's what it is and really what I want to talk about is why I think you um, should do it as a speciality because I think I can't really understand why everyone doesn't want to do radiology as a speciality and this afternoon I'm going to try and talk for about 30 minutes and then open it up to questions because hopefully I can cover all the aspects that make it attractive going forward um, to where we go. So bear with me when I try and get the technology up and running. So why why radiology? Well, as you can see, and as I already said, it is a, a career that looks at uh, the diagnosis and management of conditions using imaging. And what you can see on the front here is a uh, Isotope, a radioisotope scan, it's, a, it's the isotope component, uh, component of the CT PET scan. And what we're looking at here is the integration of an isotope into the, uh, into the Krebs cycle where, and the glucose pathway. So in essence, we inject a, uh, a radioisotope into the body. It gets taken up into the pathway that it's specifically designed for. Uh, and as it breaks down, and this, break, this isotope breaks down in the glucose pathway, it sends off a, 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 a radioactive particle, which the scanner detects. Now you can see exactly what we're looking at from here. No surprise really that the brain up here, just up here, uh, has got a lot of activity, as, as, has, as has the heart. Um, and you can see that there's some activity in the kidneys down here, with activity in the liver and spleen. And actually, the whole of the anatomical appearance is taken up with isotopes because, of course, cells do use activity as we go forward. But what we now can look at as is, is the functionality of cells. And so not only now are we looking at the anatomical imaging configuration, but also the functionality. This is a MR, so a magnetic resonance image of the brain. It's taken in a, in a section which is um, it's called the sagittal plane. Of course, it comes down the midline. And I think this is one of my favourite anatomical images of of that we obtain in radiology. And I think if 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 I can indulge you for once, this is this is the image I think that really excites me about radiology, because what you look at here is the grey white matter of the brain. This is an incredible anatomical deliberation. Here is the corpus callosum, which you will have known about or, or read about. And actually, you can see such incredible detail. There's the optic nerve going through here and the pituitary gland just tucked in here with the brainstem. An amazing amount of detail that can be obtained in a safe environment using just magnets and, and radio waves. And this really is an incredible anatomical depiction of what we can see inside of, of a person. 
Um, this is a normal MR examination, but as we as we go through and make diagnosis, then clearly this becomes really important going forward. One of the past presidents of the Royal College of Radiology said that the radiology was the premier speciality of the 21st century. And I have to tend to agree with that statement. I think it really is an, a, a career that allows you to be the doctor that you want to be. I don't think there's any other speciality that actually allows you to go through all of the subjects that you go through as an undergraduate and revisit them in the context of, 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 of your training as a radiologist. And what do I mean by that? Well, you can do paediatric radiology, neuroradiology, general radiology, emergency radiology, interventional radiology, and radiological processes throughout the whole thing. So once you've got onto your radiological training program, it really does allow you to take a step back and to revisit all of the specialities that you thought about as an undergraduate, but really haven't had the opportunity to do going forward. It's a great career for flexibility. Uh, it's, it can be patient facing, it can be interventional and hands-on as much as you want it to be. And there's a diversity in the type of radiologist that you can be. Added to that, there's an absolute shortage of radiologists currently. There's in the region of a thousand unfilled consultant posts as we stand, and that's likely to increase to 4,000 by 2025. So clearly there's career opportunity everywhere. There's opportunity in research, and there's opportunity to, in, in however you want to deliver your career. And really, those opportunities, I think, are endless. If we split this into diagnostic and interventional and increasingly therapeutic radiology, we can begin to see how we can affect and integrate the ways that we want to be and what we want to achieve as radiologists going forward. It covers all specialities. It allows us to look at anything we want to do, orthopedic, general surgery, cardiac surgery, cardiac imaging, oncological um, uh, imaging and management of patients. All of these specialities have become increasingly dependent on imaging. And where a speciality has become dependent on imaging, that, that has become dependent on radiology. The downside, of course, is that we are the doctors that no one ever sees. If you ever do watch any of the uh, medical programs, you'll never see a radiologist uh, uh, identified. Clinicians look at their own, their own film, films, often holding them up to light in any old way to do it, because there is a perception that imaging is easy, and it's not. But increasingly, all of the specialities depend on us as radiologists to inform them of the, the diagnosis and the decision making that allows them to manage their patients in the most efficient way. And so we are an integral part of that team, but we're under recognised from that. And I think in particular, interventional radiology, which is expanding greatly because of we can do things with catheters and wires that actually currently up until recently have only been done by surgical management. For instance, the management of trauma. If someone goes in with a ruptured spleen now following a road traffic accident, the first line of therapy is interventional radiology with the ability to embolize, embolize the spleen and stop bleeding, avoiding the need for operation. Diagnostics has seen, shown an incredible amount of change in the last 20 to 30 years. The integration of CT scanning, which is, which is uh, X-ray dependent body scanning, CT and PET, so we now fuse with the functionality, molecular imaging going forward, MR examination, MR and fusion. The world is actually really expanding massively by the technology that we can look at. And here's a few examples, because I think the easiest thing to do is to show you examples, because I think the one thing that we have as radiologists is the ability to show you a great deal of of imaging around the body. We are the living anatomy that you see. This is a patient with a carcinoma of the pancreas. That's a cancer in the head of the pancreas just down here. This is the cancer just there. This is the blood vessel that feeds into the liver. This is the portal vein. You can see that there's narrowing of the portal vein just in this region. This cancer has evolved this vein, and this cancer on this image alone is inoperable. And therefore, the only thing that we need to manage this patient in terms of diagnosis and management is the scan. This patient won't be referred for surgery, but will be referred for oncological management. And actually, it's radiology that's dictating that. This is another of my favourite images. This is an imaging that has been obtained on the CT scanner with an injection of contrast. So we inject a dye into the patient's 
uh, arm, and we then time the dye so the dye is in the, the concentration of the dye is maximized within the patient's blood vessel at this stage here. What we've done then is we've subtracted all of the soft tissues of the abdominal cavity, so the stomach, the liver, the spleen, all of those things um, where, where the there is, there is a change in the uh, density. We've got rid of all of those features there. We've asked the computer to ignore all that. So what we're looking at is the heart, which contains the dye and the dye in the major blood vessels. Very simple technique, but you can see how devastatingly uh, effective it is and what great pictures. And what you will have noticed is this is the celiac axis. This is the axis that comes off the main blood vessel that supplies the spleen and the liver. And you can see that there's a little bit of an ouch pouching here. And this is an aneurysm. This is a defect of the blood vessel, which needs, needs to be managed because this is a weakness in the blood vessel wall. And at this level, this could burst and cause problems. But in essence, this patient has had one injection and a scan that's taken no more than two minutes to acquire. And with computer manipulation, we can show a huge amount of information, which is really very clear to anyone that's planning any of the management going forward, and you can see the beautiful anatomical detail that can be achieved by the, this very straightforward type of procedure. In essence, this used to require an operation, but now an interventional radiologist can puncture the groin, put a small catheter and a wire up through this vessel up to here, up out into this vessel, and can block, block the aneurysm without causing the need for a major operation and with only a small pinhole in the groin just down here. So exciting stuff when you've got that sort of ability to, to watch and to see. This is um, one of the other state-of-the-art things that we can do. This is, this is a virtual colonoscopy. So this is where what we have done, um, the primary way for looking at the large bowel currently is to pass pass a telescope into the, into the large bowel um, and directly visualize the, 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 the bowel mucosa. What we have done in imaging, which shows you where we can take this and the opportunities that we have, is we've now developed a technique where we put some gas into the large bowel and we distend it, we do a CT scan, and like I've shown you before, we extract the information from the CT scan we need and we ask the computer to reconstruct. And as you can imagine, what you see when you go through on a normal colonoscopy is, is as you progress through the bowel, you see the rings of the bowel in this region just here. And this, this is a virtual colonoscopy. It's coloured pink because it was deemed by the manufacturers that the people looking at virtual colonoscopy would like to see um, very similar appearances. And if I just stop it here, you can see that this lump here is just a small polyp or pre-cancer in this region, just in this region, just there. And going on, you'll see it's pink and there's some, there's some shadowing. And this is because these, the computer is mimicking the appearances of a colonoscopy as the operator would see it going forward. We know as we go from circles to triangles that we're now in the transverse colon at this level. But I think you will agree, for a non-invasive te technique that gives you extreme detail of the inside of the colon, which is the site of the second commonest type of cancer, colonic calcinoma, in the UK. And actually, this shows you what you can achieve by manipulating the potential imaging. And actually, there's not an organ system in the body that we can't get involved in and deliver. This is a CT scan of a beating heart. This was acquired very quickly, as you can see now, and the technology allows us to do that. This is the main artery to the, the body, the aorta as it comes out. This is the uh, pulmonary, the right ventricular outflow tract, the pulmonary artery coming out, which goes to the lungs. This is the left coronary artery. This is, the, um, this is one of the diagonals that comes off the coronary artery. And you will have noticed that there's a small area of narrowing just in here. This is where the, the artery is narrowed. If that was to block, this would be a heart attack. This patient is suffering from chest pain which is caused by the narrowing of this artery, causing a, a, a reduction of the blood flow to this part of the heart. And you can see that the computer and the CT and the technology that we've used, which is required, again, just a simple injection of contrast into the patient, that we can see beautifully the anatomy down through here, and we can see what's causing the patient's problem and prevent that by, by stretching it and putting a small piece of metal called stentin to keep it open, which allows the blood to flow through there and prevents a, a, um, 
a myocardial infarction or heart attack, as you just see through there. Incredible, incredible images when you think that the heart is beating uh, 60 to 70 times per minute. But these images can now be part of the routine acquisition that we can do going forward. This is an example of interventional radiology in, in, in real time, if you like. You can see, as I've demonstrated before, if you think about the previous imaging, here is a, um, here is a catheter which is passed up, like I talked about, going through the patient's groin. This is the celiac axis. This is the splenic artery just coming out through here. And you can see that there's some filling of a structure in this region. This, this, is, this is another aneurysm of the artery. This is the artery that leads to the spleen. Here is the spleen just here. Here we've managed to pass the catheter up through the, up through the artery and past, past the narrow, the opening. This is a very weak part, and this has been caused by pancreatitis or inflammation in this region. If this was to burst, the, the patient would bleed internally um, very severely, and it would be potentially life-threatening. But by using all the equipment that we have to order, you can see that there's a huge amount of, these are called coils, these are little bits of metal that we put into the artery on both sides, which then blocks that artery and stops this aneurysm from bursting. And this all can be done just through this catheter, which can be done through the groin. True, true pinhole surgery, I think. So I just want to reflect on that again, and just really go back to, and just re-emphasize why I think radiology is so, so exciting. There's unbelievable opportunity. When I said it allows you to be the doctor that you want to be, I absolutely believe that. If you want to be up all night saving lives, you can be an interventional radiologist in trauma centre and you will be integral to that trauma centre's management of trauma in patients. If you want to, to, to look after children and, and from, from, from almost, almost in uterine all the way through, there's opportunities to do such with, with, with radiology. And actually every other branch of medicine has, has a need for and is supported by radiology. The management of stroke has been revolutionized by early identification of the strokes by CT scanning and MR examination. Oncology, oncological follow-up, outcome, diversity, all of those are integral in the way that we take things forward. But added to that, you can have a job that specializes in one organ system, or you can go for a job which is a bit of, you'd be a jack of all trades. And actually radiology allows for that as well. I'm a GI radiologist specializing in, in liver and pancreatic diseases, but actually the, I could be a general radiologist with a whole spectrum of approach. And I do a general on call, which I think is really important for maintaining um, my experience, but also my interest in the, the, the subject going forward. It is diverse and it's constantly changing. It's incredibly difficult for us to keep up with the technology going forward, but actually that's really exciting as well. It's a technology-driven speciality. People will talk about um, artificial intelligence taking over. Artificial intelligence is an add-on to support the role of radiology, but actually there's no way that artificial intelligence is gonna reduce radiologists. And so even with that caveat, there's an exciting way of expansion. As I've said, we're chronically, chronically under-resourced in terms of the way that we image, both in radiographers and in radiologists going forward. And unless we address that, this will become a limiting factor for the delivery of safe, integral patient care. And people say, well, don't you miss the patient contact? Well, actually, I think I have as much patient contact now as I probably did in the past in terms of, of, of the, the life I led before I was a radiologist. If you do do intervention, you are managing the patient and performing the procedures, often with the patient awake, because they're done under local anaesthetic. And that's an incredible thing to be able to do. I actually do outpatient clinics because I manage people with primary liver cancer with chemoembolization, which is a method of delivering chemotherapy into the tumor. So I actually have outpatients and look after patients. But if you don't want to do that, you don't have to do that. And as we go forward, radiology is now, I think, the primary diagnostic 
test that it comes in through in the early management of the patient, patient disease processes and the flow of patients through an organisation or a hospital. And that will continue to increase. What do you have to do to become a radiologist? Well, it's, it's competitive. Once you come onto radiological training programs, which are all extremely good around the country and very similar, then, then you are going to be trained to be a radiologist in five years. The challenge is getting onto the program. We have a competitive uh, uh, approach at the current time. We have a region of seven to 800 applicants per 200 to 250 places. Uh, to, to, to train radiologists. We are constantly, constantly lobbying the, the government for more places, and I would double that in the air if I could, uh, because we would be able to take on and deliver that degree of radiology um, training. But how do you influence that? Well, you get a good as CV as a medical student as you can. You need to start to develop and show that you've got an interest in radiology. That's hard because often radiology at undergraduate level is one of those specialities that people know sort of exists but don't really know what it means. And it's really difficult to believe, build a relationship with your radiological department. But what I would say is most radiologists are happy in the work they do and they are delighted when anyone shows any interest in what they do. So make a friend of your radiologist. The RCR recommends that you take a portfolio of acute care in your foundation years, get a broad-based education, that will help because you are a clinical radiologist, you are a doctor who specialises in imaging or imaging and intervention. If you are very clear about what sort of radiologist you want to be, and I think that's very difficult, but if you are, then you may want to tailor the, the your clinical period and what you do. So if you want to be a paediatric radiologist, then a period in paediatric training is going to be always a benefit, but it's not, not essential for direct entry. If you can, create an opportunity um, utilising your radiological department in order to try and do some audit or research. Again, it's amazing how, how few people contact us in radiology to be involved and how enthusiastic we are as radiologists. I certainly know my own department, all of my colleagues would be delighted to support and help anyone in terms of undergraduate or postgraduate in foraging a better lead link with radiology. In fact, we just started doing taster days because we want to show people exactly what you can do. See what we come and see what we do. See why we're so enthusiastic about this as a speciality. See how we report. Watch us at MGTs. Look at us at clinical radiological meetings. Ask, ask to come down and see what happens when your patient undergoes a biopsy, a drainage, any form of intervention. And if you're really set on radiology from an early phase, Consider an elective from radiology as a student, or actually, if you get time out during your foundation years, look to take it forward in doing that. Again, there's lots of opportunities in, in all of these departments to try and, and, and support you in taking this forward. We do, we do national recruitment. National recruitment currently, with all that's going on, is up in the air. We managed to complete our national recruitment just before the pandemic shut down uh, this year. But traditionally, the process starts in August. The interviews are in January and February. They're central interviews. They used to be eight stations. There can be pre-test, pre-interviews. It sort of depends on how many people are applying for the positions we are in. Um, you're often asked to, to, to talk about yourself. You can be shown uh, imaging examples. And there are lots of um, stuff on the web to support what you have to do going through that. We... Uh, in broad-based terms, we have about 800 applicants for about 200 to 250 places. The places vary every year, and we're pushing hard to expand the places. And I think it was 274 places this year, but we are over the region of three to one. So you have to do your homework, and you have to be prepared to be challenged when you go through it. But I would have to say, if you are successful on obtaining the place in radiological training anywhere in the UK, then you will enjoy that training to its maximum. This is a very unusual uh, chest radiograph. I'll add it in just for, for um, uh, interest value. This is total liquid ventilation. This is a, a technique that was being performed in Canada about 15 years ago when people were very had very uh, uh, challenged lungs. 
lungs that were uh, showing acute respiratory distress syndrome, not, not, unusual, not unlike the changes that we see associated with COVID-19. And this was a way of looking by putting um, isofluorine in the lungs to try and maximize the way that they uh, did the ventilation. It wasn't a successful study, but it gave some very nice images together. Um, take home points, uh, have a look. Before you rule radiology out as a speciality, have a look at the department, visit the radiologists, see what they do, understand why radiologists are happy in the work that they do, and, and make a friend of your radiologists. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Mark, for that. Um, I think we're just going to have some questions. So if anyone's got some questions from Professor Mark, um, I think I saw one a few minutes ago. Um, someone asked about how in the future are we still going to need radiology because obviously technology is kind of taking over everything. Yep, technology's taken over, but currently there are, current today there's probably 250,000 unreported scans in the UK um, because we haven't got enough radios to turn it around. And I think that um, the advent of, of new technology and artificial intelligence, which actually is becoming much more integral and already there, is going to facilitate the position of radiology in the overall patient management. So I think it's more exciting than, than a, a threat in terms of where we go. Because I think what it will do is it will be used as a filter to take out the normals. So if you're reporting 100 chest, uh, chest radiographs, for, for example, it's likely that 80 of them are going to be straightforward normals. And if you can get rid of those and then give, give us as a specialist the ones that are potentially abnormal and we can add, add, and we can add um, uh, both the expertise and the diagnostics in a timely fashion, that's very exciting. What you need as a patient is your scan performed as quickly as it can be and reported as quickly as it can be in terms of, of where you go. And so actually we don't do that because of the volume of work currently in the UK. But if we had mechanisms that supported that, then it would be absolutely incredible. I think, I think imaging is going to lead the pathways in medical care going forward in the next 20 to 30 years. Um, another question not was, that easy, oh, sorry. But grammarly. Another question was asking if um, the career differs much if you specialize in diagnostic radiology after you become a doctor compared to if you just got a degree in diagnostic radiography. Um, diagnostic radiography is are uh, they're part of the team. So the diagnostic radiography is about the professional uh, qualification that allows you to obtain the imaging. So I work very closely with diagnostic radiographers who's, who I depend on very heavily to know about the best methods of getting the imaging. As a diagnostic radiologist, I am medically qualified, which they are not, you know, with a formal medical degree. And my job is to take that imaging and to interpret the imaging to um, make the diagnosis. And so it's very much a team-based speciality. We can't work, we can't move without diagnostic radiographers and we're absolutely dependent on them to produce the highest quality imaging. And all the imaging I've shown today has all been obtained by um, diagnostic radiographers at the absolute top of their game. And so, so there is a difference, um, but the difference is that I have the medical degree and the ability to, to, to do it. The lines becoming blurred because what we want to do is we want to uh, allow some of our uh, our, 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 our diagnostic radiologists to, to radiologists to develop the skills that they have and to start moving into the areas of expertise that they've shown they, they're really very good at doing. And so there's a, they started to take on the reporting role very much and we support this because actually anything that helps us to, to deliver what I've said already, quick imaging that's done accurately is important. The trouble is there isn't enough diagnostic radiographers either. And the, 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 there is a shortage of diagnostic radiologists, so they are like gold dust as well um, in terms of where they go forward. Thank you. Um, someone said, as a radiologist, do you specialise in administrating as well as studying the images, or are they separate things? 
Do I, sorry, I missed that. I just missed the middle bit. So do you specialize in administrating as well as studying the images or are they separate? Oh, so, so there are certain images that I obtain myself. So ultrasound, for instance, is hand-on, so that um, I look at other people's ultrasound and I give opinions on the other people's diagnostic ultrasounds, particularly around liver disease, but I also do ultrasounds myself. And with diagnostic intervention, uh, intervent with, with interventional radiology, then that's very much hands-on um, because you're actually using the imaging to guide needles or catheters or wires, so I've shown, um, into the place that you need to put them in. So there's a combination of two. Some people do nothing other than interpret images. Some do nothing other than diagnostic, uh, that do um, interventional radiology. I'm very fortunate. I have a very mixed job and do a bit of both. Thank you. Um, Kelly just wants to know a bit more about the application process, if it involves any exams, and if it does, what the exams are like. Um, it, it, it varies a, bit, a little bit year by year. We did have... Um, about five years ago, it was a tough application process. Um, I was on the interview panel, and I thought it was incredibly tough going forward. It was very regimented. There were, as I said, eight stations. You talked about your CV. Um, we, we handed people imaging and asked them to talk about imaging. I mean, what we're trying to show is, is an interest into it. Um, a few years ago, we had so many applicants for radiology that we, we put together a short exam. Now, I don't know what the exam was like, but there was a lot of information put on the net about where that was going. Um, I, I don't think that was particularly uh, uh, helpful to us, but, but um, and going forward, if the pandemic stays where it is, we may have to think about how we do this without interview, and that's going to be a challenge, because that's a challenge that HEE has put forward. I mean, I think my advice to people that want to go into radiology is to declare that interest as, as soon as you think you want to, or at the very least, take the opportunity when you're doing your F1, F2 years, to just visit your radiological departments. Most radiologists are very happy in the work they do. And we don't have junior doctors um, in, in teams as other teams do. And so we are delighted if someone comes along and says, I'm interested to see what you do. And I would speak universally. I don't think there's a radiologist I've ever met who wouldn't want to, to, to spend some time with a, a colleague in training who's interested in in radiology and, and showing them what they do and what they think. The trouble is most people don't ask. And so we don't have a lot of people coming down. But if you do that, then you will build a relationship and you'll understand the breadth and depth of what we offer in the, the, the organization. And that's what people want to see when you, you go to interview. They want to see that you understand what you're getting yourself into. Um, I guess if we look at sort of gaining work experience pre sort of starting university, I think there's been quite a few questions about the impact of COVID and people not being able to get work experience and sort of how else do you think they can sort of get a sort of idea into what radiology is about? I think it's, it, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's very hard in COVID and we're going to have to think about the, the way that we do it in terms of where we go. But I've... The, the the best methods I can think of is just is just to well is to, to integrate yourself with the with the department. We've started doing, for instance, we started doing for for both undergraduates and postgraduates. We would we do our meetings online now, so you can see if I run a multidisciplinary team meeting. So mo everyone everyone who has cancer in the UK has to be discussed at a, at a multidisciplinary team meeting, which has to have a radiologist at that meeting. And so those meetings now are online and we are beginning to identify how we can use them much more as a training opportunity to, to show exactly what we do. Because of course you can do that in isolation. Now it's only a small part of what we do as a work, but it does also show you what we do as radiologists and the role that we have in the overall patient management. So I would, I would think if you, are, if you are an undergraduate or actually a postgraduate, it comes back down to... Um, just liaising with your with your department and, and, and finding what opportunities they have. And we must have, in, in Bristol, in my own department, I probably don't know the number of meetings we have because we're all diverse in the interest that we have in terms of radiology, but we will have meetings every single day where radiology interfaces with clinical management and you can see images being produced and understand exactly what's going on. Thank you. Um, someone said here, Leah says she's a first year diagnostic radiography, radiography student and she's due to start placement soon. 
is there any advice you can give her to ensure she gets the most out of her placement? Ask lots of questions, actually, um, and, and, and really ask to see everything you can within the department. Um, we've just recently, we seem to have had, we've had really enthusiastic students in Bristol and they come along and, and I would say, go and see everything, go and see everything you can, you know, go and see the intervention, CCT, go and spend some time in nuclear medicine. The department is your greatest asset because actually that's where all the equipment is and what's going on. And I think it comes back to what I've said already. I think that if you see the department as your greatest educational asset and the opportunity to learn, and you then integrate with the radi radiographers who are at the top of their game and the radiologists who are at the top of their game, then they will all be very keen to, to demonstrate everything to you. And so actually, I love it when we've got students that come in to see the intervention. We always talk about it, we run through it with them. They come in, they're often, um, they're often gone through and had a look at the procedures that we would do because we try and make them available so they know what's going beforehand. They've often read them up and we can then discuss going forward and, and, and really you, you get an understanding for the diversity of what the speciality you're in. And I think it's a really exciting time for radiologists and radiologists. And I think also I would want to say is that, that I think that the margins between the two of us are going to be blurred. We need good imaging teams um, going forward and actually that's, that's teams that are expert on their delivery. And there's some things that we're seeing with radiographers reporting hand head scans, for instance, um, beginning to develop how they do the CT colonography that I demonstrated before, being experts in delivering that, doing the first reads of those so that we can have a look at them and, and double read things, which is a really safe way to doing it. So for anyone that's involved with training the imaging at the moment, I think it's a really exciting time. And I guess sort of leading on to that a little bit, I think there's been a few questions about what the difference between a radiologist and a radiographer was. And someone has kind of said, are they right in saying that radiographers take the scans and radiologists read the scans? That's, 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 the, that's the public persona of what we do, to be honest with you. And it's probably the, the simplest way of putting it. You know, radiographers take the pictures and we interpret the pictures. It's a hell of a lot more than that. I mean, you, if you think about the image that I showed of that, of that blood vessel with the aneurysm on it from a 20 cent, from a, from a 30 second injection of contrast and a 20 second scan. That's an incredibly um, technical thing to achieve. And a radiographer would have achieved that imaging. It's my job to interpret that imaging. And so in essence it is, but actually the, the diversity of imaging and how we do those basic principles is changing so much. And as I said, radiographers are becoming much more expertise in particular areas because because there is an opportunity for them to develop like that and we want to encourage it very much and, and as such the work there's so much imaging work coming through that we need to be um, all of us need to be doing the, the what we do at the best of our level so i need to be looking at the, the 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 really difficult liver imaging because that's what i can add value to the, the patient you're doing and as as that allows everyone to be involved and it's and again i, I think it's a really exciting time i agree um, Marie's also asked that sort of apart from reading scans, is there anything else that a radiologist does as well? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, I, I've, I've only touched on what an interventional radiologist does now, but if I, I'll just think about, I'm just going to run through a few things that interventional radiology do, uh, because it's, one, it's very exciting. Trauma centres in the UK are dependent on interventional radiologists. They save lives every day in trauma centres. If you have a, a big accident in the UK and you're bleeding internally, your best chance of survival is an interventional radiologist going and and um, and um, stopping the bleeding by blocking the blood vessel. They will reopen blood vessels. We will we can unblock the liver. We can treat cancer with with heat therapy, with ablation, so we can burn cancers. We can biopsy stuff. So if you see something abnormal on the scan, if you've got a, a collection of a pus or, or or infection, we can drain it. Um, the neuroradiologists are taking clots out of people's brains so that the stroke doesn't have the same impact that it did before. They're coiling aneurysms in the brains. Um, the, the musculoskeletal radiologists are, are replacing vertebral discs in the spine. They're, they are uh, they're treating spinal secondaries by gluing the vertebral bodies so they don't collapse. Um, we are we are unblocking uh, the uh, the the. Uh, GI tract. So if you're if you're if you've got a cancer of your gullet, <coughs> excuse me, if you've got a cancer of your gullet, 
We can put in a piece of metalwork that opens it up. If you've got cancer in your colon, which is causing you a blockage, we can open that up. And it's all done by minimal access. We can put tubes in to feed you. So we can put tubes into your stomach and feed you that way. I mean, the um, opportunities of what we can do is unbelievable in terms of interventional technology. And I haven't, we can unblock kidneys, um, all sorts of stuff. I haven't given um, enough, in a way, enough time to the interventional radiology because it's a huge, huge and expanding um, speciality in its own right. What I wanted to do is to show you the diversity of what radiology can do. And so the problem with interventional radiologists is that if we think radiologists are gold dust because we haven't got enough of them, interventional radiologists are platinum dust. There are really few of those. And actually, we are going to become increasingly dependent on people going into that speciality. And that really is a patient-facing, front-end, um, um, exciting, life-saving speciality. And I guess kind of linking into that as well, Maria sort of asked if radiologists are in demand during this pandemic and also if they're already in demand before the pandemic. We were already in demand before the pandemic. We have been become, um, because COVID is a lung condition, we've been in demand looking at people's lungs. Most people on the ITU will have multiple CT scans and the, the ability to put lines in um, and to, to do the things I've talked about on people that are on intensive care under image guidance has really made us um, a, a, a key to the pandemic. It's thrown us into the front line, and I've, for a few of my colleagues, that's been an unusual place to be. Some people feel they don't want to have the patient patient approach, but actually, I think that what it's demonstrated that imaging is integral into a really effective um, uh, and 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 really efficient patient management. And actually, that's going to go on ahead. And I think that actually, the that is really, if anything, um, demonstrated our value. Thank you. Um, Elias also asked if there's a chance to move up in your career in diagnostic radiography. Big one, if there was a... If there's a chance to move up in your career in radiology, diagnostic radiology. Uh, uh, in, in radiography or radiology? Radiography, um, I think radiography is changing in terms, if you were a radiographer, traditionally your only opportunity was to move into management and people didn't want that. But I think what, often now there's an opportunity in education, training, I think research is being looked at in a lot more ways. Traditionally, we haven't had a huge amount of research that's facilitated through um, radiography. In terms of radiologists, then um, once you become the consultant, it depends on where you want to do and what you want to go, but actually how you develop the service. And often that's the challenge because in terms of what was available in terms of imaging when I was appointed and what's available now, it's been a huge, huge change and it's rapidly changing. And so in order to maintain all of the skill sets that you need as a radiologist, that's quite a challenge. And I don't think that there's often uh, a speciality in, in medicine where you're appointed a consultant, but the stuff around you changes as rapidly as we see in, in radiology. And so the, 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 if you like, the exciting bit is once you've got your consultancy in terms of becoming a diagnostic radiologist or interventional radiologist, that's not where it ends, it's the beginning, and it's the beginning of the stuff that you need to do and go forward. So it's continuous development. Okay. Um, next question, I guess, is something that's a bit specific that you might not know, but Kelly has asked if you know if the seven deanery is particularly competitive for radiology. It's, 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 one, of the, it's one of the more um, sought-after posts, but um, what I would say is I think that um, the, the college works very hard to make sure that there is... Um, a very good standard across the whole of the UK. And so I, I think that the, the key for me is the fact that the deaneries there is, they all fluctuate there to some extent, but the challenge is getting in. Once you're in, in a lot of respects, as the, the training you get wherever you are in the UK is very good. Thank you. Uh, Mia wants to know if there's any important A-levels to have um, if you want to do diagnostic radiography. I think one of the things I would say is that both diagnostic radiography and radiology in its essence, I mean, when we start training in our first year, we do do an exam in physics, which is a bit of a shock to us in the medical world because I never really understood physics at A-level. By the time I did it, as a, as a, I, I, I did, did my radiological exams. I've been four years post-qualified. Any thoughts of physics had just gone. So I would say a, a good mass-based physics combination 
would stand you in very good stead because you need to understand about radiation, about ionizing radiation, MR physics, MR imaging is all physics based, as is ultrasound. So there's a natural, there's a natural partner there. And, and you know, they're very sought after A levels, and I think that they're very good grounding for both radiography and radiology. Thank you. Um, Aaliyah wants to know what the starting um, average wage is like for diagnostic radiographers. I don't know is the answer to that. <laughs> it's, it's, I ought to know, but I don't is the answer. But the, the easiest thing to do is to the NHS, if you go on the NHS website, it shows you the salary for all, all um, healthcare professionals. So the information is out there. What I don't want to do is give you, my radiographer colleagues will shoot me for not knowing, but um, but um, I, I'm a, I don't want to mislead you on that one. Thank you. Um, Maria sort of wants to know how long the training pathway is to become a radiologist. So in essence now, I mean, what you do is you do your undergraduate years, you do your, your F1 and, and F2 training, and you can apply then. So within, you can be two or three years within qualifications from so you qualify from the university, then you can have two or three years and apply for, for for radiology, and the radiology training pathway is five years. So you can be eight years out of medical school, and you can be applying for your consultancy. It's quite impressive. It, um, and and to be frank, if you want a job, then you will get a job, because there are every hospital I know has unfilled radiological places. And Kelly wants to know what um, exams you have to sit during specialty training. Yeah, um, you have to sit the FRCR. The FRCR is a um, three-part examination. The first part taken at the end of your first year or sort of nine months into your first year, FRCR part one, is uh, uh, a physics and anatomy-based examination. So uh, it's, I think it's, it's, it's multiple choice or best, most appropriate answer. Um, then you take your FRCR Part 2A, and the Part 2A now is done at the beginning of your uh, end of your second year, beginning of your third year, uh, and that's very much a clinical-based examination. Used to be six parts, of now I think it's two parts now, um, um, which is the, the idea is that it doesn't interfere with your second year. And at the end of your third year, then you take your FRCR 2B examination, which is a three-part examination where you have um, what they call long cases, where you get six, I think it's six cases of imaging to integrate. You get the rapids. That's always a challenge because I think you get 30 cases and there are some normals in that just to keep you on your toes. And then you get two half an hour vivas. Each viva has two examiners um, and they can ask you anything about imaging. So it's a tough exam. But um, but the, we've just completed the exam and we've done it online for the first time. Uh, we completed it three weeks ago and the pass rate in the UK in the last FRCR part two was 85%. So it's a tough exam, but people are well prepared for it and, and the training prepares people well in taking it forward. We don't have an exit exam. Once you've got your part two B, you then do your subspeciality training in the last two years of your training. I think it's a challenge. I think there's a lot to learn in five years. I say to my trainees, you've got a thousand days to learn radiology, so you can't waste a single day. And I think that's a reflect. I think that's true. I think there's a huge amount you have to learn now. But that's the exciting bit about it. And when I said before that you actually get to revisit a lot of the stuff that you did as an undergraduate and probably didn't appreciate, I absolutely mean it. You can go into radiology thinking one thing, you see something else that interests you. Actually, you can go and do that as well, and, 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 and there's, that's very, that's very. Um, there are very few specialities that allows you that flexibility. Thank you, um, Maria. Just, I think she said sorry if it's already been answered, but I think she just wants to know what your subspecialty in radiology is. My, my subspecialty, I'm, I'm a GI radiologist specialising in liver disease and pancreatic disease. Although I do all sorts of imaging in the abdominal cavity, so. And I'm, I'm, very, I'm very fortunate in my job. My job is a combination of diagnostic and intervention. And it's fairly unique now because you tend to either be a diagnostic or interventional radiology. But I trained as a vascular radiologist. And so I do a lot of the intervention around the liver. So there's not much in the liver that I can't do or reach or unblock or block or what have you. Um, and that's really exciting because I get to see the patients all the way through. So I deal with, um, with liver disease. 
So background liver disease, alcoholic liver disease, cancer of the liver and cancer of the pancreas going forward in oncology. And that's really, really exciting. And so uh, I utilize all the imaging techniques uh, and, and also we do MRCT and all the diagnostic and intervention things. So when someone said, do you, or you do, I think one of the questions was, uh, is it just about reporting scanning? No, I don't really know what's going to happen on my day. I can start thinking I've got a day of just reporting and end up spend, spending it um, draining an abscess or doing something else. It's very varied, and I think that's one of the attractions of the speciality. And just a question for me, sort of what made you want to go into radiology? Very good question, actually. Um, I, was a, I, was a, I was a cardiology trainee before I went into radiology, and I got somewhat frustrated with ward rounds and um, outpatient clinics. And I, I, it was at the time that interventional cardiology was just coming in. And, and so I got involved in that, and it made me realize that there was a huge amount of, um, uh, of, of imaging that was just expanding and be, becoming very exciting in terms of the cross-sectional imaging and the intervention. And I realized that this is going to be integral in patient management. And I think the other thing I haven't said enough, actually, is that, that we very much work in teams as radiologists. We work with our fellow radiologists and our radiographers, and I think that's quite appealing as well. I work with a fantastic team. I've got five other consultant radiologists who do GI studies around me. And that's, that's a really exciting place to be. It keeps you on your toes and it allows you to, to share ideas and take things forward. And I think that's a great way of working as well. Um, Aaliyah wants to know what you like most about your job. The variety, I think. The, the, the variety and, 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 and how, how my job has changed. You know, I, as I said, I do, I, I, I've recently, in the few, last few years, started doing outpatient clinics, something I never thought I'd do again, but gives me the opportunity to talk to people and talk to them about their cancers and my treatment of it. Um, I think that the, the ability to make the diagnosis is extremely important. Um, the, the ability to have an impact on, on people's patients' lives still is really important. If I see something on a scan that I know is, is one unexpected or two, um, life-changing, I can then call the tune and, and make sure that the patient's managed in the, the best possible way. And that's really, really very important. Um, also, another one for me, I guess, sort of radiology is not something that I think is talked about a lot in medical school as like a potential um, career option. I think a lot of people tend to get a bit more into like, the surgery, the cardio, the thing, like you said. Um, is there sort of a way you think medical school can sort of make radiology more an option out there so people know that is like a specialty that exists? Well, that's a very good question. See, I think, I, I mean, I think radiologists should teach anatomy because I think that, that our understanding of anatomy and the, and the, the interaction, if you, if you know, um, if you know where those arteries are that make the difference and you understand where those arteries come from, your ability to understand anatomy is second to none. And I think we've got some fantastic, as I've to show, some fantastic imaging that allows us to do that. And so I think that, you know, we are the second biggest group of consultants, I think, after anaesthetists. So we're, we're a huge group of consultants in terms of where we go. Um, uh, and, and I think that some medical schools are coming around to the, the, the fact that, that now imaging is such an integral part of the way that they develop and they teach, particularly in the early phases of medical student teaching, um, that, 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 that um, I know of certain places where radiologists are integrated in terms of anatomy and taking things forward. And I think that we need to do that. You're right. We are the unknown. We are the unknown medical specialist. You never see radiologists featured on any sort of imaging program or, you know, casualty or ER Gray's anatomy, which they were talking about at the last session. You never see a radiologist. I mean, that's they don't exist. Um, and I used to have to. I used to have to get the the X-rays for casualty. So I always used to smile because I used to know what was coming up because it used to be filmed in Bristol. And you know, they people would hold them up to the light and go, "This is so and so, so and so." And that's the way it is. We're not portrayed, and if anything, um, we're not we're not recognised for the the influence that we have on patient care, and that can be frustrating. We don't have the same kudos as our surgical um, uh, um, um, colleagues, but actually, we are almost more important now in terms of how that patient is managed. If you have a cast name with the pancreas, and I say you're inoperable, doesn't matter how good your surgeon is you're not going for an operation. And that's really changed recently. And actually, that's that's where we're going. 
So that's that's I think why we're not we're not there. We still haven't moved behind things. But I think in the next twenty or thirty years, imaging will start to lead the way in terms of how how, how we do things because it's just available and we can see what's happening inside of someone so quickly. Um, Mia wants to know what the hours are like, and I guess that could sort of link a bit into work-life balance. Yeah, the hours are good, actually. The hours are good because, of course, um, we've been able to adapt. So if you – work-life balance in, in, in radiology is phenomenal. So you can do the job that you want to do. So it facilitates part-time working. It facilitates um, some time off from the, your career. It, it really allows you to do the way that you want to work. It, if you are some some hospitals, will, will, what they do is outsource their on call so that they will have a they will a certain period of time they will then switch off from their own radiologists and they will send that to a company that will report their scans out of ours. Um, we do that from ten o'clock at night to to six o'clock in the morning. So when I'm on call in the evening, I'm full on until ten o'clock at night. But then I come off call, and the imaging's are sent to a, a company that, that will report them on our behalf. That, what that does is it allows me to be fresh in the morning. That means I don't have to work overnight, which is always a bonus. If you are an interventional radiologist, you're going to be up, and you're going to be up at night, and because there aren't many of you, you're going to have a fairly intense rotor. Um, but my rotor currently, I do do intervention at weekends, so I do one in six weekends where I provide an interventional service, and I do a one in 12 on call when I go up to 10 o'clock at night. It's busy now. You know, we will do, in, in the course of a day, we will do 80 CT scans um, on, on our acute admissions of people going through. So up until 10 o'clock, I'm, I'm working hard. I'm as, probably as hard, or working as hard as I was when I was an SPR um, coming through. But actually, there, that's important imaging. And so we can switch over. Other hospitals switch the, the, the ability to outsource earlier in the day and don't do any on-call at weekends. So there's a whole spectrum of stuff, but 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 again, it's very it's very variable, and it's very up to facilitate the career that you want it to be. Thank you, um, Aliyah wants to know if you recommend any specific books that can be used to learn anatomy and vascular anatomy, I guess as well. I think the yeah, I think I think the the web there are a lot of websites now uh, where you can look up all the anatomy very quickly and the the the, the um, Radiopedia is a very good website. There are other websites that I tend to, to uh, if I have it, I've got to admit, I, I use Google a lot to look up these things. And I think that actually the ability to integrate the imaging and cell with a particular problem is a, is a very good way of doing it. I like the drawing books because I think that you can then apply those to the, um, well, I can't remember, um, Netta is the book that I think is is, is a fantastic book. It's, it's It hasn't changed in the last 50 years, but it's the line drawings that shows shows things very, very helpfully. And I think what the important is that um, that it's really important that uh, that we you have that integration. And that's what I mean about using the department as your biggest asset, because I think that's where you can learn. You'll see a case, you'll think, well, what's the anatomy around that? You go away, you look it up, and that becomes, you, you'll never forget it. Um, Maria wants to know if you can, I guess, not subspecialize and just be a generic radiologist. And if so, what's that called? You're just a general radiologist, actually, and you can actually. So if you if you work in a in, in a, a, a smaller hospital, then then you will do a bit of everything. So you'll be musculoskeletal, you'll be a GI and abdominal, you'll be a bit of head, neck, and neuro. <coughs> the thing is that, that that what we're seeing more and more um, now. Is that uh, even in the in the smaller departments, that that each each general radiologist will have an interest in something else. So you'll be a general radiologist, and perhaps your 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 area of expertise will be in the chest. And so your colleagues will ask you difficult pictures about the chest. But but if you want to work in, in a hospital that's slightly smaller, then you can do a bit of everything. And that's that's the attraction because you know that's. That's quite a challenge, I think. I mean, I'm very pleased that I don't have to do a bit of everything because I struggle to do the bits that I have to do. So, so the, the fact that I've got to do a bit more, but, but the point I'm making is that you can do exactly as you want it to, to be what you want it to be. And it's nice to have an area of expertise as well. Um, and I guess our last question for the day is, um, someone just wants to ask about if you're a patient and you're pregnant, could you get radiography or would it affect such harm the baby? 
the, the, uh, the, the question is slightly unusual in how it's said. I mean, we have we one of the things that we we all work hard, both radiologists and us, is to avoid ionising radiation in the pregnant patient. Um, because there's no safe dose of ionizing radiation. You can't have an MR scan in the first trimester of pregnancy because we don't know that it does. And part of the expertise about that is providing the alternative. So if you if you are pregnant and you need to have a, a test done, then you can have the alternative in terms of uh, ultrasound, or if you're after if you're after the first trimester, an MR examination. And that's where the expertise comes in trying to direct exactly what's going on in terms of where you go. I hope I've answered that question. Yeah, I think you have. Thank you so much for taking time out on your Saturday. Thank you. Us about, I feel like we've learned a lot about radiology. And like I said, it's not really something that's mentioned a lot in medical school. It's not. Either. It's not. But what I would say, I just want to say before we go, is make a friend. If you're interested in radiology or radiography, make a friend in your radiology department. I mean, the radiologist for radiologists. They're very happy departments in the main. And I, and I, would, be, I would be astonished if people weren't receptive to your inquiries and they will answer the questions far better than I've been able to, and they will tell you the best course of action. But it's an exciting time for imaging, and I think I can't understand why anyone would want to do anything else. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really helpful, Professor Mark.